what you're doing?
The past and the present come together when Johnny Cash enters this jail.
They were terrible lizards, don't you know? Some ate plants and some ate meat. Some ate fish and some ate beets. One was called a diplodocus. One was bigger than your school bus. One was called a triceratops. Three horns to stop anything it hops. Now, can't you just see yourself walking along, leading your pet trachodon, or feeding your brontosaurus rex, or scratching your diplodocus neck, or riding on a stegosaurus back, or swimming in a brachiosaurus track? Oh, what a time and oh, what fun, playing tag with your iguanodon. And if we had uh, dinosaurs now, could they get along with a horse and a cow? <laughs> well, I wish they hadn't have become extinct. Dinosaurs would be nice pets and friends to have around to run outside and play with every day, don't you think? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Happy Friday to you. I'm glad you could be here today. We're going to have a fun, chill stream. And you're here right at the beginning. So welcome. Holy cow. If, uh, if anybody's here for the very first time today, then an extra special welcome to you. It's great to have you here. Let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach and uh, camera's looking a, a little weird let me adjust these lights just a titch hmm. is that better no not really no oh, whatever anyway Danny Anduza not a lighting engineer a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here to talk to you about fossils, to give you an inside peek into how fossil science works. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I study dinosaurs, I publish on dinosaurs in the scientific literature, I dig up dinosaurs in the field. That's what I was doing this summer, and that's what we were live streaming this summer too, so check out the, uh, the VODs over there on YouTube if you've not done so yet. It's a ton of fun digging up dinosaurs in Wyoming and Utah this year. We had at least three new species of dinosaur we were digging up. Probably more. Time will tell. But, uh, anyway. Yeah. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Today's broadcast, like I said, is going to be kind of easy going. I'm going to be... Murph, almost a whole year, 15 months. Murph, thank you so much for your ongoing support. It means a tremendous amount to me, Murph. Thank you. Thank you. Holy cow. Do I appreciate you. Thank you very much, Murph. It's good to see you. Um, so yeah, yeah. We're doing some 3D printing right now. We're going to be talking about a very similar dinosaur to this one, which has been newly described. I don't have the paper for it yet, so we won't do like a deep dive on this animal yet. But we'll talk about it a little bit today, especially once this print is finished. Maybe we'll clear that away, take away the supports and everything live on stream. But uh, I'm printing a Hypsilophodon skull right here. We'll be talking about that dinosaur. We'll be talking about Hypsilophodontians and uh, what they're all about. Hypsilophodontians, a.k.a. Speedos, sort of. Speedo is a broader term than Hypsilophodont, but it largely means something similar. And, uh, yeah, we'll be uh, doing a lot of Q&A today. If anybody new or old has got any questions about dinosaurs, about fossils in general, about natural history about extinction, evolution, the philosophy of science, any of that good stuff, do not be afraid to ask those questions. Those are the bread and butter of this stream. So, uh, 
Don't be shy about that. Yeah. Um, did I finish the TikTok dinosaur from yesterday? TikTok dinosaur? Says admin. That's what I heard anyway. TikTok dinosaur. You lost me, says admin. Fish. Oh, TikTolic. No, not a dinosaur. That's an animal hundreds of millions of years older than the than the first dinosaurs. Tiktaalik is a uh, is a creature from the Devonian. Oop. This again. Afuera. There we go. Yeah. Um, Tiktaalik is one of the first land living what we call tetrapods. Um, in fact, it's like a a beautiful transition between fish that lived in the water and uh, and fish that live on land like us. Land living animals with uh, with backbones. Uh, there we go. Proud grandpa of every land living animal on Earth. There you go. Yeah. Uh, um, Tiktaalik. It's a it's a very cool critter. Um. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, Tiktaalik, or a creature like Tiktaalik, was the ancestor of all the dinosaurs and us too, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So anyway, but am I finished with the Tiktaalik print? Well, the answer is yes. There's one piece there. There we go. There are... One piece here. Two pieces here. You can see the snout. Yeah. One of the shoulders right here. Another shoulder, right there. Ooh, got the back of the torso here. And here. And then the final piece goes on right here. I haven't assembled it yet, but a very busy morning actually. Um, yeah, take a look at that. Tiktaalik, right here. The fossil looks something like this. Yeah. Um. Here, let's do like this. And let's find you a decent... Oh, there you go. Yeah. I think this is from the original descriptive paper, at least from the press release from it. There we go. Tick Talek. Oh, and there is a lovely... <laughs> Long time no see. I like that. Ray Troll uh, image of this animal. I like that a lot, yeah. But Tick Talek, yes, the name is uh, derived from the Inuit, Inuit language. Very cool. And now we've got it here. I'm going to paint this, of course, because it doesn't look like much right now. It needs some painting to really bring it out. And also some glue, obviously, and some sanding and smoothing and all that good stuff. It's going to take some work, but uh, I'm really happy about this. Very excited to show this off when it's done. Oh, yeah. And yeah, walking fish. There you go, Claire Burr. Yes, indeed. Let's look up a little video on Tiktaalik, shall we? Yeah. Mm hmm. Hey, let's take a look at this. Oh, wait, did we watch this one already? I think we did. Yeah, gun. It was definitely the biggest adventure of my life. Yeah. Here, give me a second. Let me 
get this set up for streaming properly. Proper audio and everything else. And... Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh, somebody made a flexible silicone model of this creature? Let's take a look at that. Holy cow. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's actually really beautiful. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh man, is it being pulled by a fishing line? How do they do this? That is super cool. Oh, that's really neat. Yeah. That's pretty cool. This guy just put that together? That's really awesome, actually. Here. Let's see if we can find... Hmm. This, maybe? Yeah, here we go. Neil Shubin discovered a fossil which would shock the scientific world and be called the missing link. It did uh, not really. It didn't sh shock this. This is exactly what we expected to find. Um, in fact, it's actually like a wonderful example of how you can use paleontology to test ideas. It's paleontology is one million percent an experimental science. Some people say, "Oh, you know, paleontology and geology and." Astronomy. They're not experimental sciences. They're more historical sciences. Those people do not know what they're talking about. We run experiments all the time in trying to find new fossils. If a fossil, you know, if, if we have a prediction about like a certain transition in the history of life should take place at this time and place, we can test that hypothesis by going out to rocks of that age and seeing if it exists. And in this case, it did. Which is super cool. I'm guessing this is not super well written, and we might watch a different video. He discovered this unknown species on Ellesmere Island in... Yeah, uh, nuts to that. Let's find something better. Um, let's see here. What's this about? Two Cincinnati staples are teaming up for something that has been 375 million years in the making. That's right. <laughs> Cincinnati Museum Center and Ryan Guy's Brewery have released a prehistoric beer that'll take your taste buds way, oh boy. way back in time. <laughs> and to tell us more, we're joined by Cody Hefner with the Cincinnati Museum Center. And good morning, Cody. Yeah, cool. Anyway, not what we're looking at here. I guess they made like a beer that they called Tiktaalik something or other. But, um... Here, let's take a look at this. HHMI always does really good stuff. This might be a little long, but we'll kind of skip through it. Yeah. Our planet is teeming with many kinds of animal life, including groups with defining structures, such as the four legs of land animals, the feathered wings of birds, and the dexterous hands of primates. Uh. Understanding the origins of these structures and of the groups that possess them has long been a central quest of biology. Hmm. Charles Darwin asserted that each kind Old of Chucky animal D. must have evolved from pre-existing earlier kinds of animals that lacked those structures. He boldly predicted that buried in the crust of the earth were animals that connected one major group to another. This is an example of running an experiment using the fossil record. You make a prediction, you go out and test it, you look for the fossils. Such transitional fossils would be intermediate in form between earlier and later groups. What made Darwin's prediction so bold was at the time he stated it in The Origin of Species, no such fossils had been found. Nope. His critics 
immediately latched on to the admission that transitional animals are somehow missing from the fossil record. Over the decades... I mean, that's the thing, is that the fossil record was barely explored at all at that point, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty funny, like... So many people have such a problem with the idea that living things change over time, you know, like hair. It's become a standard talking point for those who have closed their mind to the science of evolution. There you go. Yeah, this is the stuff. Right, so this is... But in fact, since Darwin, paleontologists have unearthed hundreds of transitional creatures that have enabled yep. us to reconstruct the origins of many groups. And even so, searching for such fossils remains a challenging adventure. And finding the right one can change the way we think about the origins of living creatures. There's Tiktaalik there. Ah, gorgeous. Yeah. For me, paleontology has always been about filling the gaps in the story of life. And for a long time, one of the biggest ones was understanding the origin of animal limbs with fingers and toes. Paired limbs are a feature of many animals, but there's little at first glance that suggests the limbs of different species are related. On frogs, they're springy. On elephants, not so much. <laughs> they're feathered on eagles, not on bats. But inside the limbs of mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and birds, one finds a common architecture. Yep. Here's a dog. Dogs run and jump. What do you have? One bone, two bones, little bones, and then the digits, the equivalents of the fingers or toes. Yep. And, of course, here's a bird. It flies. Its limb has been modified into a wing, and it has one bone, two bones, lots of bones, and then digits. The amazing fact yep, there you is go, Claire. every four-limbed animal uh, walking the earth today has this fundamental pattern. One bone, two bones, little bones, fingers. Mm -hmm. That pattern suggests a connection between these very different groups of animals. And it's not the only feature they share. They also all have a backbone. Mm -hmm. They're vertebrates. The history of vertebrates has been captured in rock we can accurately date. Fossils reveal when each of these groups of animals first emerged. The youngest group is the birds. Go further back in time and you'll find the first mammals, and then the first reptiles, and the first amphibians. And then you get to 370 million years ago. Yeah, what's Suddenly, There are no four-limbed creatures or tetrapods anywhere to be found. Where the first tetrapods came from has always been one of the great mysteries of biology. I mean, it's not like there weren't animals or vertebrates around 400 million years ago. There were, but they were all fish. Yep. Both bony fishes and cartilaginous animals fishes, like these sharks. Fish. fish might seem Ooh, unlike fish. candidates Beautiful. to be the earliest ancestors of frogs, horses, and humans. They don't even have a big grouper. They have fins. Despite their different external appearances, there are revealing similarities. First, fish and tetrapods are vertebrates. Mm -hmm. And early in life, when they are embryos, they look remarkably similar. Finally, DNA analysis shows that fish are tetrapods' closest relatives. Yep. All of this suggests four-legged animals did indeed come from fish. But how did a fish with fins... I've been there. That's the uh, aquarium in Chicago. ...with four legs. As a young scientist... I wanted to find fossils that could help answer that question. Hm. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. This is so cool. Like, when we're talking about how science works, this is, it's, it's so cool. The discovery of Tiktaalik has become kind of one of the, the all-time great stories in the, the history of science. It, it illustrates so well why paleontology is so important. And so that's uh, one of the reasons why I like talking about it so much. That's why we're talking about it right now. <laughs> the world's a big place. The Earth is a giant planet. And fossils are very small. So how do you find those things? 
Well, there's a checklist we run through. We look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age. You know, if you're interested in the origin of dinosaurs, there's one age of rock to look at. If you're interested in the origin of land living creatures, there's another age of rocks. Then you look for places in the world that have rocks of the right type. The yep, kinds sedimentary of rocks, rocks. That are likely to hold fossils. So those types of rocks are sedimentary rocks, rocks that have been laid down by, you know, by flowing water or by stagnant water. Um, sometimes by sand. Sediment depositing created these rocks. It's not from lava, and it's not from other rocks getting cooked or deformed. So that's igneous and metamorphic rocks, respectively. These are rocks, sedimentary rocks, that are laid down by sediment. Just a bunch of crud accumulates, and eventually it turns into rock. Those are the rocks that you find fossils in, if you're lucky. A lot of things have to come together for an animal to be fossilized. For starters, it has to be in the right kind of setting where sediments form. Yep. And soon after it dies, it has to be buried. Oh. Before its remains are ravaged by decay, weather, or scavengers. I love this. This is like a, uh, a nice little alternative to our other video about uh, your step-by-step -step guide on, on becoming a fossil. I like this. It's nice to know that we've got more than one video that we can show here. Yeah. Setting where sediments form. Yeah, you know Smurf and Clearbird. And yeah, you know what dies, I mean. It has to be buried before its remains are ravaged by decay, weather, or scavengers. The dirt and mud burying it has to harden sufficiently to protect what's left for thousands or more likely millions of years. After which, something, say erosion, has to bring the embedded remains to the surface. It usually is erosion, then, but occasionally someone who it's cares about such things, stuff like, like me other or stuff. my longtime colleague Ted Deschler, has to wander by and find it. The fossils I wanted to find would have been alive in the Devonian era, between 365 and 385 million years ago. Hmm. But where could we find the right kinds of rocks from that era? But you can still see in these ledges. I remember sitting in the office. And we were doing this sort of usual banter one day about something geological. We uh, and I love, I think we just talked about this the other day, didn't we? But I love this story so much. This gets me right here because I have had moments like this hanging out with other paleontologists. I remember one time back when I lived in Bozeman, Montana, before I moved back to California, I lived with three other paleontologists in a basement apartment and I had bookcases like these. Uh, in the living room, kind of in the common area. And my room was just behind the, the bookcases. Um, so we used to hang out there on like a Saturday morning. You know, everybody would get up and have their coffee or hot chocolate or, you know, sometimes I'd make pancakes for everybody. And we'd just, you know, like, hey, what do you think about this idea? And we get into some sort of rollicking discussion about the history of life on Earth. And... I'd be able to go over and pluck books off the, off the shelf and be like, well, have you ever thought about this? And like, look here at this illustration, check out this figure, that kind of thing. And it just became this free flowing thing. I, I really missed that when I moved away. And it's, it's lovely that I can kind of have a bit of that nowadays, but streaming here on Twitch, I guess it's kind of a solo performance, but you know, um, well, not really. We've got wonderful questions and insights from people in the chat. It is a give and take. Absolutely. What am I saying? But I really enjoy that. It's a lot of fun for me. But anyway, this, I really relate to this because sometimes a book that you, you pull off the shelf will have the kernel of some idea in it. All right, Morley, thank you for the raid. Morley has arrived with two raiders. Welcome to Paleontologizing, R.A. Morley. How you doing? It's good to have you here. Tell me how your stream went. Yeah, we are talking about this critter right here, Tiktaalik, whom I finished printing early this morning. We still have yet to uh, assemble the pieces to glue them and then paint them. But uh, you'll see here's the snout right here. There's the body. There's the scapulae, the shoulder blades right here. See some of the scales along here. Yeah, it should look like a uh, well, like this. Yeah, in fact, that's it right there. Come 
on. Please, Embiggen. There we go. Yeah, Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik Rosier. Um, really, really important specimen for understanding the history of life on Earth and our own origins. You know? So yeah, we were watching a little video on that. And, uh... Here, let's go back a touch. I was talking about how nice it is to have books on the shelf to be able to bring out in a discussion, and uh, there we go. From that era. But you can still see in these ledgers. I remember sitting in the office, and we were doing this sort of usual banter one day about something geological. We had a college textbook, and just thumbing through the, the diagrams in the book, and boom, there was this figure that changed our lives. I remember <laughs> seeing that and saying to myself, holy cow, this is what we're looking To me, like, as a researcher, this is one of those things that, oh, that I get so excited about. I relate to this so hard. It's such a wonderful feeling when you have a burst of inspiration. There's an insight that you come upon, often because you see it in a book. Uh, ah. It was a map of North America, which highlighted three areas of Devonian rock. Of Eureka. Right yes, yeah, Steely Dan, yeah. Kennedy, yep, yep. Two of those areas had already been worked on. So we focused on the third, the yep. Canadian Arctic. My heart was racing when I saw that because, and I'm sure yours was too. I mean, no yeah. paleontologist had worked on that, expressly looking for early tetrapods. Then you dug out the uh, the aerial photos, and that's when I got <laughs> kind of terrified. <laughs> and Dirk Struan, I am having a nice dream so far. I hope you're enjoying watching. Welcome to paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. I remember seeing this for the first time, thinking, you got to be kidding me. You know, look at all this snow. How do you work there? No, guns are part of it, I suppose. The Arctic presents some unusual challenges. You're far from help, so you have to bring everything you'll need. Mm -hmm. And you have to move fast because the season is short. And you don't want to be there when the weather turns. Oh, and is Tiktaalik like a lungfish? What's the difference? Thank you, Claire, for reposting that from uh, Googie Schilling. Tiktaalik is related to lungfish, but it's a, it's closer to us than it is to lungfish. So let me pull up a cladogram to show you. Yeah. Um, well, first, let's look at our tree of life here. Let's go to tetrapoda, tetrapods. So tetrapods are creatures that, you know, mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians. Strictly speaking, rep birds are a kind of reptile, but whatever. We're going to simplify things here. Tetrapods are this group right here. That's all of these creatures, including us. We ourselves are tetrapods. We are mammals like this opossum. So here's some examples of different tetrapods. Everything from birds to frogs to turtles are all tetrapods. Now, zoom out a little bit. You widen that circle just a little bit. Like the next Russian nesting doll there, the next bigger one is lungfishes and tetrapods. Dipno tetrapodomorpha. And then low finned fishes, including tetrapods, are that one. So tetrapods are a kind of lobe finned fish, which is pretty cool. So you branch off right here, you get to your lungfish. Um, Tiktaalik would actually be a little bit closer to true tetrapods than, uh, than modern lungfish. So let's try... Uh... Tiktaalik phylogeny. Um, there we go. That'll do it. So you've got lungfish. There's a Queensland lungfish right there. My favorite lungfish. And coelacanths up here. And then you've got fishes that are even closer to tetrapods like Eustenopteron, Pandarichthys, and then Tiktaalik. 
kind of fills a gap there between taxa like Pandarichthys and Acanthostega. Acanthostega with eight fingers on it. Um, yeah, and then you get to living tetrapods down here. Does that make sense? So Tiktaalik is kind of between lungfish and us. Yeah. Thanks for the good question, Googie. Thank you. So when the helicopter drops you off the Arctic for the first time, you're standing here saying, what am I doing here? You know, you're thinking, well, polar bears. That's the first thing you look for. Is there anything on the landscape? Everything I'm going to be gluing like this together as we watch this. First year. The last thing on your mind are fossils. It's hard to believe when you look out across this frozen terrain that once this was a warm, watery world swimming with life. There's this huge disconnect between the present and the past. What we see today is a valley with red and green rocks that are tilted, stacked one on top of the other. But that's not how it was in the past. These valleys have been carved by glaciers that have moved back and forth. And those red and green rocks actually at one point extended across the valley. And they were straight, they weren't tilted. Now look inside the rocks and what those rocks tell us that this valley 375 million years ago was a giant floodplain. And that flood Tomas says, I wonder how the first terrestrial insects looked. You know what? Actually, I'm going to do this later because I'm going to need to do a bunch of sanding for this. And I don't want to have plastic filament dust flying around all over my office. Um, I'm going to go do this outside later. So we won't. On second thought, we will not be gluing this right now. Because um, I really don't want to have to, like, put a respirator on live on stream. So we'll we'll do that later. But yeah, uh, insects were the first terrestrial animals. And the first terrestrial insects, you know, uh, that is to say, insects came onto land before critters like Tiktaalik did. They were the first animals to come onto land were insects. Um, and uh, the first of them would have looked kind of like, I think kind of like millipedes. Um, or no, maybe they were more like eurypterids. Shoot, let's let's take a look at that real quick. Um, first terrestrial arthropods. So it wasn't actually insects per se that were first, but they were other kinds of arthropods, things that would have looked kind of like millipedes or something like that, I think. Um, or maybe like sea scorpions, uh, eurypterids. I'm not a million percent sure. Let's... Millipedes, okay. They're among the first of the terrestrial arthropods. But yeah. Um, yeah. Members of Myriapoda, which are millipedes, centipedes, and their relatives. Yeah. So anyway, it was a critter kind of like a millipede would have been the first land, like truly land-living arthropod. Um... Yeah, although critters like sea scorpions, some of them actually came up onto land occasionally, but they weren't, like, specifically evolved to come up on land, it doesn't seem like. Yeah. Anyway, does that make sense? Yeah. So land crustaceans, says Gimplag. Yeah, which, strictly speaking, insects are crustaceans, kind of? There is a really interesting paper that came out, I think, earlier this year, or was it last year? The Pan Crustacea paper, um, basically saying that, shoot, insects need to kind of reassess them. They belong to a group called Pan Crustacea. Like, let's look that up, too. Yeah. Um, Pan Crustacea. Yeah, it's the clade that comprises... Clade is a, a group of organisms that all share a common ancestor, so they all come from the same place. They all have got the same ancestor. It's a clade, all the same ancestor, that comprises all crustaceans, including hexapods, insects, and relatives. Uh, the group is contrary to the Aletocerata hypothesis, in which hexapoda and myriapoda are sister taxa, and crustacea are only more distantly related. 
As of 2010, the pan crustacea taxon was considered well accepted, with most studies recovering hexapoda within crustacea. So there you go. So it turns out, anytime you you hear somebody talk about lobsters or crabs and go, oh yeah, you know, those are just ocean bugs. Whoever's saying that, maybe they're trying to be uh, contrary or annoying, but they're actually they're actually correct. They real they literally are a kind of crustacean, which is really interesting. Anyway, a lot of this comes from uh, molecular studies, like you see right here. I'll give you a link so that you can read about this if you'd like. There you go. Um, but yeah, so it turns out the first creatures on land, the first animals to conquer the land, were not vertebrates like Tiktaalik. In fact, nobody ever thought that. You know, it was invertebrates. Pan crustaceans. Which is cool to think about. But anyway, let's, uh... Yeah. Ghostly Ghoul says, I can finally gather the information to say no, shrimps is not bugs. Um, well, no, it kind of, they kind of are, Ghostly Ghoul. Or at least, at least insects are a kind of crustacean. Shrimps are crustaceans and, and so are insects. So yeah. Yeah. I call them water bugs just to annoy him. I mean, they, they literally are, Lenina. Yeah. Or rather... If those are not water bugs, then bugs are land shrimps. Not true shrimps, but crustaceans. You know, insects are crustaceans. And S.B. Harkin says, horseshoe crabs are spiders. They're not true spiders, but they're related to spiders. Here, let's go back to our tree of life here. Let's jump from there to Limulus. There we go. The horseshoe crab. Yeah. So these guys are related to spiders, but they're not true spiders. Does that make sense? Horseshoe crabs. Merostomata. Uh, so they're related to spiders and ticks and scorpions. They're their own group, so they're not a kind of spider. But they are closely related related to spiders, mites, scorpions, and their relatives. Ticks, too. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Kennedy, yeah, true bugs are insects that have sucking mouth parts. Usually, I think, Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ken, how are you doing? Hello, hello. Welcome back. It's good to see you. We're talking phylogeny right now, obviously. Yeah. And bugs are land shrimps. Nice, says Triceratops. Kind of. Not true shrimps, but they're land crustaceans. Yeah. Um. Anywho, let's get back to uh, Tiktaalik. We were talking about the uh, the origin of land animals. By the time Tiktaalik was flopping up onto the land, we already had, uh, you know, animals on land for a long time before that. But they were all arthropods. Crustaceans and then insects. Crustaceans and then myriapods, things like uh, millipedes and then insects. But yeah, yeah. Floodplain. These valleys have been carved by glaciers that have moved back and forth. And those red and green rocks actually at one point extended across the valley. And they were straight, they weren't tilted. Now look inside the rocks and what those rocks tell us that this valley 375 million years ago was a giant floodplain. And that floodplain was filled with rivers that swelled their banks and sometimes shrunk, but in those conditions formed swamps and streams of all different sizes. And <laughs> inside those streams was diverse life. Yeah. Including the critters like Tiktaalik. Yeah. A fish with features that would ultimately enable animals to walk on land. But even if it had been there, could we find evidence of it buried mm. on one of the nameless hillsides that had built up <laughs> and eroded over the past 375 million years? 
And that's really funny, Kennedy. Pill bugs slash wood lice slash roly polies, etc. are said to taste like shrimp. Well, they are crusta they are true crustaceans, Kennedy. Those critters are true crustaceans. People think they're insects or something like that. They're not. Not at all. They are crustaceans. Again, going back to our tree of life here. If we look up Isopoda? Isopods. Yeah, isopods is the name of that group. Pill bugs, sow bugs, roly polies, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Isopods. They are a kind of crustacean. Which is really neat. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, here, if we, uh. There we go. I like. I did not know they were called this. Armadillo die day. Armadillo die day. I guess because they look. They curl up like armadillers? Yeah. 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 Anyway, for the band, see the pill bugs. <laughs> They're an American pop and. Power pop and psychedelic pop group that emerged from the indie scene in the late 90s. Wow. Anyway, they are not crustaceans, but these guys are. Armadillo die day. They're, uh... Pillbugs and co. Holy cow, there's so many different common names. Pillbug, roly-poly, woodlouse, slaterbug, cheesybug, sowbug, doodlebug, slater, butcher boy. Cellarbug, carpenter. Family-friendly broadcast. Not gonna say that. Door closer. Parsons pig. Bench biter. Chiggy pig. Chucky pig. Potato bug. Or grammar sow. Great grammar sow. There are actually even more common names for these guys in the U.S. too. It's kind of funny. But yeah, pill bugs. These guys are crustaceans. Shoot, that's the whole reason I I pulled this up is to show you that they're crustaceans. They are a terrestrial crustacean group in the order Isopoda. So there you go. If you want to read more about them, there you go. Yeah. Why are the bugs cheesy? Don't taste those, says Frannington. <laughs> I would agree. Yeah. 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 Piggy Pig. I mean, little did you know when you tuned into this broadcast today, ghostly ghoul. You'd be learning what a chiggy pig is. <laughs> Who calls them that? Chiggy? It's, it's gotta be the Brits, right? Yeah, in Devon in the UK. Speaking of Devon, this time period that we're talking about right now from the video is called the Devonian. The Devonian period. Right there. It is named after Devon in the UK. Uh, because that's where its rocks were first studied. So yeah, the Devonian. There we go. But even if it had been there, could we find evidence of it? The Age of Fishes. There you go, Clareberry, yeah. That had built up and eroded over the past 375 million years? Is that right, Kennedy? That's really funny. Lover so how chompers. do you find fossils? I pick up a lot of stuff, right? Sometimes it's prospecting. This is <laughs> sometimes most of the time. That's sometimes it's a leaf, uh, but occasionally, you know, it's a jaw with teeth in it. So what you begin to learn is to tell the difference between white, which is not bone, and white, which is bone, teeth, or scale. Once you have yeah. that in your mind, then you start to apply that search image to other rocks. Here's another scale here that stands out like a sore thumb, and then we go. If you look around. Right, right here. Okay, so this is the underside of a of a skull. So you never know where you're gonna hit it around here. You know that's why we keep on looking. Yep, prospecting. That's how it works. But that first expedition ended without finding what we had come for. <laughs> In 
And as our second trip drew to a close, we were still searching. Then, a bit before our scheduled departure, we had a real scare. The team had separated. And the idea is everybody needs to return back to camp by radio call. You guys see Jason? No, I see Jason. You see Jason? I, said, I asked you that question. You didn't see Jason? And all of a sudden it became, where's Jason? Well, this is our youngest member. We were looking out for him the hmm. entire season and no Jason. Uh oh. I mean, my heart was really beginning to race. R.I.P. Jason. Holy cow. <laughs> Uh, I'm guessing the gun is for polar bears, Steely Dan? No, don't ever... Chat, do not ever give a gun to a polar bear. That's not a good idea. Um... Shoot, you know, if you... It's not even a good idea to give a moose a muffin. You should never give a gun to a polar bear. It's dangerous enough <laughs> as it is. The, the world's largest terrestrial mammalian carnivore? You don't want to give that animal a gun. What are you thinking? Holy cow. Anyway. Entire season, and no Jason. I mean, my heart was really beginning to race. I hear footsteps Take a pancake? The tent. That's, that's probably fine, Creatrix Brit. <laughs> His eyes are like globes. And he's like, I found it. I mean, every pocket was burgeoning with bones. Because I got these bones. He's laying them out on the table, one after another. <laughs> It's daylight 24 hours a day. So we ran down to Jason's site. As soon as we came to this bluff here, and looked down, we saw why Jason was so excited. Because beneath our feet were fossil fish bones, fragments of fossil fish, many of them, thousands of them. It wasn't just one fish, it was a whole aquarium. It was different species. It got better, because as we walked up the hill, and we followed that carpet of fossil fragments, it stopped, meaning hmm. it likely came from one layer. And if we had yeah. any luck at all, we'd find that layer and see what's inside. Look, look, it's glowing like in a video game. See, right here. Look. And we followed that carpet oh. of fossil fragments. Yeah. Um, I just, as a, a working vertebrate paleontologist, you know, I, um, there's loot there. Exactly, Steely Dan. I just want to tell you, having worked in the field and prospected for fossils many times, um, it is actually exactly like this. Just like in a video game. Like the ground will glow and it'll make like a little kind of noise and that's how you know that there's fossils there and then you press x to dig them up you know meaning it likely came from one layer and if we had obviously i'm kidding if anybody's that's the thing about twitch you never know if somebody's really really taking you seriously when you're making an obvious joke so i want to want to make it clear that i'm making a facetious remark here this is a joke these are spoofs and goofs you know but yeah, they added this in post. It doesn't ground doesn't actually sparkle like this in real life. At any luck at all, we'd find that lair and see what's inside. Yeah. Hard as we tried, we couldn't discover what was buried in Jason's Mickey notes. There you go, Tommy to Platicus, yeah. <laughs> Maelstrom doll. <laughs> but we kept coming back to it in following years. To dig, chip. <laughs> and go Golgonek, yeah. The second week of July in 2004, we're all working in series in this hole, you know, where my head is right next to Farish's feet, and Farish's feet is next to Steve Gates, and we're digging together, and Steve says, hey guys, what's this? Oh, and by the way, feet is next to Steve Gates. oh, you see this very expensive looking piece of equipment? Um, this is something that I actually have on the Amazon wish list. Um... Yeah, uh, this is an extremely, uh, you know, expensive and, and complicated piece of, uh, Speed is next to Steve uh, of scientific Thanks. instrumentation. It's called a whisk broom. Yes, and I believe there's one of those on the, the Amazon wish list. There you go, Smib. Yeah, I know, right? You know, paleontology. We only use the latest and greatest technology. Um, like, uh, what is it? Corn fiber brooms? Um, screwdrivers for digging? Hammers and chisels? You know, holy cow. Uh, yeah.
Five star rated by rodents everywhere. There you go. And yeah, you remember it got eaten by rodents. Um. <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> Yes, yes, Stephen J. Gould. Peace be upon him. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Brannington says, Corn Brooms take me all the way back to shop class in high school. I'm sure that's not very far, Brannington. You seem young and sprightly. You give that impression, Brannington. Yeah, yeah. My head is right next to Farish. Um, oh, see, Whisk Broom. Oh, and an all? Yeah. You see that? Just the incredible uh, precision and, like, these are devices that are, you know, they cost a king's ransom, you know? All this complicated, high-tech machinery. Hey, guys, what's this? Ted and I go running over to see what Steve was referring to. And a quarter of a century old, Bradington? That's older than me. I'm 21 and single, remember, everyone? Yeah. <laughs> what we saw was this V here. It was covered with rock. And as soon as we saw this V and we saw these teeth under it, it became very clear that this little V we're seeing is the yeah. tip of the snout. And that this was a snout of a flat headed fish. And it was sticking out of the rock. So if we had any luck whatsoever, the rest of the creature would be encased in the rock. <laughs> and here it is. What's really wonderful about this specimen is that we have pretty much the whole thing. And the whole thing is put together. That is, it's the head right here. is connected to the body. Yeah. And the body is connected to the fins. So we know that this fin comes from this body. Yeah. And when we put it all together, we see this creature is about four feet long. And some of the biggest were about nine feet long. What's really amazing is that this is an animal that Darwin would have predicted. A yep. real mix of characteristics. A combination of fish-like and tetrapod-like features. Like a fish, it has scales in its back. And it also has fins with, with fin rays. But like a tetrapod, it has a flat head with eyes on top. Mm -hmm. And when we look inside the body, what we see are these huge interlocking ribs that suggest Beautiful. that it had lungs. When you put the body and the head together, you see it had a neck where the head could move independently of the body. What that means yeah, mine can't do that because it's one piece. You're outside the water, find prey, and avoid predators. So we have many bones of these animals, including this one, which is a hip bone of these creatures. Yeah. And look at that acetabulum right there. That's where the femur sits. Can you call it a femur on a fish? I bet you you can. We're going to call it a femur. But that's where the thigh bone goes into, slots into the hip. Is that the hind fins were already evolving into legs while these animals were living in water. I get really excited when I see the front fins of Tiktaalik. <laughs> Here's one from one of the larger specimens. And what you see is the shoulder, but also some of the fin bones inside. What you see is a version of the one bone, two bone pattern that's inside our own arms. You have one bone, two bones. You even have a version of a wrist. There you go. And once Gorgeous. the fins were strong enough to lift its body out of the water, a whole new frontier opened. Pretty cool. Over millions of years, the two pairs of fins in fish like Tiktaalik would lead to the two pairs of limbs in every tetrapod. Pretty neat. So what does this all mean? What it means is that our arms and legs are derived from the paired fins of our fishy ancestors. So how fast did this transition happen? Well, we know that Tiktaalik didn't exist in a vacuum. There are other creatures, other transitional fossils that are more fish-like and others that are more tetrapod-like. And yep. these creatures existed for over 15 million years. So what this means is that this great transition from fish to tetrapod didn't happen in a single step, but happened gradually over time. Yep, there we go. Very cool. Ken wants to know, is the femur correlative to the pelvic fins? Bingo. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's why they're called the pelvic fins, because they're near the where the pelvis would be. Um, that's exactly right, Ken. Yeah, yeah. Um, femur slash lower legs. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, yeah, yeah. Good stuff.
anyway, this was a huge deal when it was published, which is really cool. I love how big they went with the press on this. It it makes makes me really really happy to see this. This is around two thousand six or seven, I think, something like that. Um, yeah. The discovery of Tiktaalik made headlines because it is one of the earliest in a series of fossils that illuminate the transition from water to land. And that's just one key transition that fossils have shed light on. Yep. One of the very first Archaeopteryx. was the evolution of birds right from feathered dinosaurs. That's now one of the best documented transitions in the story of life. Oh, this is Could be better though. We're working on it. Other well-studied examples tell us is that what at first seemed to be huge leaps are almost always products of a series Which of smaller... my speciality. There you go, Ken. Yeah, me neither. That's true for when our fish ancestors first came to land, when dinosaurs took to the air, and when we first stood upright. Cool stuff. Oh, and I love this right here. This is how you can tell they are well funded here. Um, look at the action packers they have. These things are not cheap. These rubber made action packers. Uh, or maybe this just goes to show that normally we don't have a ton of money. If you talk to like a an astrophysicist or a NASA scientist or somebody, they'd be like, "What? Why are you getting hung up on plastic rubber made containers?" It's like, no, these these th that that one right there is probably like eighty dollars right there. Like that's that's. It's a pricey piece of equipment. And they've got three of them right here. I mean, holy cow. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. I uh, I hope you enjoyed, everyone. Here is a link to that video if you'd like to watch it on your own or give it a thumbs up or do whatever you do to express gratitude for content on Wiki uh, Wikipedia, YouTube. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, good stuff. Kennedy says, you know how smart the cetaceans are? They looked around and decided to go back to the ocean. Yeah, a lot of creatures have done that over the years. Sea snakes are one, sea turtles, sea lions, seals. Actually, with sea lions and seals, it's the same event, I think. They split early on, pinnipeds. But anyway, marine iguanas? Yeah, they're they're in the process of doing that, Steely Dan. And inshallah, they will continue to make that transition, and they will become fully marine at some point. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, and you did see sea snakes scuba diving in the Philippines. Kennedy. It almost sounds like a tongue twister. And it's therefore likely that we're here today because by the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. I it's was true. in San Diego this week. Ah. Bar next to a guy that didn't think dinosaurs existed. Oh, but I, at first, Courtney Raptor, I thought you were going to say that you sat next to the bar at a... Well, at first I thought you were going to say you went to the Nat the Natural History Museum in San Diego. And then I thought you were going to say that you sat next to a paleontologist, but in in fact, it's the opposite. How did you find out that he didn't think dinosaurs existed? Has he never seen a bird? Oh, we made it to the zoo. Oh, the zoo is brilliant. So I'm glad you got a chance to see that. One of the best zoos in the world. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, that is a thing. Thank you for the 11 months of support, by the way, Courtney Raptor. I appreciate that more than you know. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for keeping me here on the air. But, I don't know. It, I guess, you know, the internet can be used to, to make the sum total of human knowledge more accessible to the world at large. Or it could be used to make people so much stupider. Which is unfortunately the case with stuff like this. Um, 
Yeah. Ugh. See what I mean? Yeah. But a ghostly ghoul says, I refuse to believe in people who don't believe in dinosaurs. If I didn't believe hard enough, maybe they'll disappear. That's the thing, ghostly ghoul. I kind of believe that unironically. I don't think... And here, let's pause for this. For dramatic effect. I do not think that there is anyone on the planet who legitimately is convinced in their heart of hearts they are 100% convicted in their belief that, that dinosaurs aren't real. I don't think there is a single person on our planet who actually believes this in their heart of hearts. I really don't. Like, if somebody was actually passionate about that belief, they would go out and they would try and demonstrate that. If they actually had the courage of their convictions, if they really were convinced that this was true, then, you know, it should be pretty easy to demonstrate that dinosaurs are all a hoax or something, right? But nobody ever does. Because it's just people saying stuff. You know, people will say all kinds of nonsense online, and they don't actually have to believe it. Some people really don't believe in anything, and I, I'm i mostly convinced that, like, with people like this, that's the case for them. You know, it's just like, they think it's fun, or they think it makes them some sort of iconoclast or something like that. I don't know. And this is coming from somebody who's had relatives, like, members of his family ask him, Hey, do you really think that those creatures were real? And it's like, that's a question that comes from real curiosity. And you can say to someone, well, yeah, of course, let me show you. Let's talk about it. So I've met people who are genuinely curious and just, for lack of a better term, ignorant on the subject. Like, they just don't have personal experience there. They don't know this firsthand. I think that's very different from, like, somebody online who says, oh, dinosaurs are fake, or whatever. I don't think they're actually convinced of that. Nobody is that dense. And, like... Yeah. I don't know. Somebody like that just needs somebody to talk to them. You know? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Courtney Raptor says, willfully ignorant in this case. There you go. Yeah. You know? It was like, with uh, this tweet here, yeah. <laughs> I don't believe that Isaac Newton ever existed. However, I'm a firm believer in leprechauns and the Easter Bunny. Yeah. Um, especially on Twitter, which is now called triplex.com or whatever. I don't know. Can I say that on a family-friendly broadcast? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It sounds like something that shouldn't be work safe now. What a stupid, stupid idea to change the... I'm, I don't know a lot about branding. I'm not, I'm not a corporate person like this, but why in the world... Why in the world would you change the name and destroy all of this priceless branding that you have, one of the world's most recognizable brands, Twitter, and then make it something incredibly generic. Just one of the most boneheaded decisions. It makes no sense on any level. Uh, anyway. Anyway. On x.com now, whatever. Um, you see a lot of people nowadays who are, they think that they can get paid if they just get a ton of, of, of engagement on a post like this, on a tweet. Oh, we can't call them tweets now? What, what, the, what do you call it? Ugh. Anyway. I 
used to like Twitter, you know? It used to be fun, and it's dying. It's dying. Uh, and you see this sort of thing more and more and more. The stupidification of, uh, of social media. Anyway. Yeah. Um. And there you go, R.A. Morley. I remember that, too. <laughs> uh, uh. But anyway, you know what? Let's take a hard left right here. Let's whip the wheel around and let's get into something more positive. And this is a nice Spanish moment. Thank you there, Ghostly Ghoul. Great song by The Clash. Oh, yeah. yeah. I stopped by the P.O. Box yesterday. And so let's do some P.O. unboxing. I don't have a video sting for this segment yet. I'd like to make one in the near future. Got some ideas. But some members of this community have very kindly sent some stuff to the P.O. box. Why don't we go ahead and take a look at some of that? Raise our spirits a bit. Celebrate this community. Yeah. Uh, and R.A. Mortley, that is really cool. Find trees in India? I've not heard about that. Send me a link! I want to hear about this. Yeah. I was kind of astonished when I went to the P.O. box yesterday. There was so much in there! I was not expecting that. Enough that they had to put certain things into, like, a locker. They put a little key in my box so that I could go get it out. Let's take a look at what members of this community sent in. First off, we've got a couple of postcards here. And the first one has got a mammal on it. Take a look at that. A very cute mammal, I gotta say. Yeah. Meow indeed. Yes, Claire Burr. And this is from Devil and Mrs. J. Greetings from Tennessee, it says. I just wanted to say hello and thank you for all the wonderful content. This is sent to me and Ios and Lord D, so I'll have to pass this along to them when I see them next. But thank you, thank you, Devil and Mrs. J. I appreciate you thinking of us. Look at that kitty. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I almost wanted to orient it like this, but that implies that the cat is stuck to the ceiling and... I don't like that idea as much. I like this a lot more. And that's good because this is the true one. And is that catnip right there? I think it is, Claire. Here, let's take a look. Let's go up close. Yep, it's pure. That's catnip there. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, and it is a cat, so possible, reason to take it. Possible it could be stuck to the ceiling, I suppose. But that implies that the ceiling is very sticky to also hold all this catnap. So, Occam's Razor. You know, the, uh, what is this? The idea that a hypothesis which requires the fewest number of assumptions is probably the the correct one it's probably it's probably oriented like this that's probably the floor but yeah anyway thank you devil and mrs j i appreciate you yeah thank you thank you for thinking of us 
I will pass this along to Ios and Lordy so they can show it off on their streams too. Yeah. And Triceratops says it's an Australian cat from our relative frame of reference here in North America. There you go, Triceratops. Yeah. And it is a lovely postcard, isn't it? Upstairs down. We got another lovely postcard here. Ooh, sparkly. From a place called Los Angeles. Very nice. From SoCal, Los Angeles. I am from Northern California, of course. From uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Look, I got a postcard of my own here. Greetings from beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but yeah, there we go. Down south, L.A., Los Angeles. And this... It's from Epic of Sam. Holy cow. Sam. Oh, and this is not to me. Hang on. This is just Lordy and Ios. Well, Sam, thank you for sending this. I will give it to Lordy and Ios. You know what? Not for us. <laughs> not for us. Ouch. I know, right? <laughs> I will give this to Lordy and Ios. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even check. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Anyway, I'll make sure it gets to them, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> the perils of a shared P.O. box. There you go, Squiggles. You know, we're, we're on a budget. Delorty, Ios, and the other one would have been worse. It would have at least... At least Sam would have thought of me, Vix, Alex Vixen, you know? Shoot. Yeah. But... We've got three more items. And uh, increasing in, in size, we have... This one right here. I don't know who this is from. Let's see here. USPS... First class package. Well, well, well. Let's uh, open this up, shall we? To Danny Anduza there at the P.O. Box. What might this be? What wonders await in here? Check for ticking and wear gloves. Here. I don't hear any ticking. Yeah. Um, it also does not have uh, an address that says Unabomber, so I think I think we're good. Also, he died recently. R.I.P. You know what these are, chat? Do you know what these are right here? Yeah, these are plutonium. No, I'm kidding. Um, they're magnets. Yeah, so I shouldn't put them too close to the camera. But these are little neodymium magnets, and these are precisely what I'm going to need, Miss Yvette. Yeah, for... They're not tasty treats, May. That's not a good idea. No, these are for... Um, or here on Thingiverse, 18 piece magnetic human skull model. I'm going to be printing this. Yeah. There we go. And these are some of the magnets that I needed for that. So to whoever sent this to me, thank you, thank you for doing that. I don't know who you are, but Anonymous Hero, I appreciate you. Thank you very, very much. That is fantastic. 
with this, just in time for Halloween next month, we're going to be assembling a full-size human skull model complete with magnets so that we can take it apart and talk about all these different bones that make up a human skull. It's going to be really neat, and I cannot wait. Thank you for this. Thank you kindly. Uh, kind stranger, I salute you. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Um, excellent. <laughs> Lovely. Let me go put these with my other magnets so I don't misplace them. Squiggles says that'd make for a cool puzzle. Put the fossil together. Oh, you have no idea. Here. Yeah. Something else we're going to be working on is this skull. Also held together with magnet. Skull of Irritator. This is going to be my next big 3D printer project, I think. That's going to be really, really neat. Being able to assemble the skull of a theropod dinosaur live on stream. Just have it snap together with magnets. This is going to be wild. And, uh... I cannot wait for this. This is going to be a wonderful science outreach tool, and chances are I'll be able to use some of those same magnets for this, too. Um, so, again, thank you to our anonymous gifter. I appreciate you more than you know. Yeah. Yeah. And the irritator sounds like a bad wrestler's name. Well, it was the name of a... It's a funny story, but it's the name of a Spinosaurid dinosaur. I work on Spinosaurids, and so I'm really, really excited to print this. Um, we'll be starting this before too long. So, yeah. Excited. Thank you again. Courtney Raptor says, that's amazing. I mean, it's going to be amazing when it's done. And as we work on it, so... Yeah, don't let me rest on my laurels yet. We gotta, we gotta do this. Then it'll be amazing. But I've got the files. We've got some 3D printer filament. It'd be nice to have a little bit more, so that I can go ahead and do this. There's more filament on the wish list, by the way. Um. But yeah, to whoever sent me these magnets, these are not from the Amazon wish list. This was somebody who took the initiative to find those magnets elsewhere on the internet. Go to that site, go to checkout, put the P.O. Box address in there, and then send it to me. This took some real foresight, and I really appreciate it. Honestly, buying things off the Amazon wish list is so much easier. This person went the extra mile, so thank you for that, and I appreciate you very, very much. Yeah. Good stuff. Now we've got two more items here. Let's check them out. This next one here. Yeah. Is from Amazon also. But this also implies it wasn't on the wish list. Because it went to the P.O. box here. What could this be and who might it be from? Well, well, well. Let's find out. Well, well. B U Y S K mini table clamp small painting and crafting. That sounds useful. What is this? You know what that is, Claire Burr? Well, well, well. Let's put the tape on these so I don't have to rip the box. Who knows, maybe we could reuse the box or something. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Re 
repeat. Well, we've got a beautiful little clamp here. Very nice. Yeah. This looks like it will be quite useful. Like a little vice clampy guy for uh for use in 3D prints. Really, really cool. Uh to help hold your things when you're tearing off supports or sanding. You helped pick this out, Claire Burr. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. And it should be reversible. That's really nice, Claire. Thank you, thank you. Who? Well, Claire, you, you must know who it was who sent this originally. Who was that? Gamers Tavern Show, thank you for the follow. Welcome. Welcome to Paleontologizing Gamers Tavern, Tavern Show. How are you doing? What brought you here? Welcome. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. This is going to be really useful. I really appreciate this. This is really nice. Um, you just printed one like that. Very cool retro road show. Nice. Checking with them now. Thank you, Claire Burr. And that is a very thoughtful gift. Not asked for, but very useful. I will be using this. As we work on more of our 3D prints, like our Hypsilophodon skull that we're printing right now. This should actually be done pretty quick. And then I've got a Heterodontosaurus skull to print after that. Um, lovely. Yeah. And the vice clamp gets the job if the clamp isn't fit to serve. There you go, fall machine. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah. Played by Christian Bale, right, Fall Machine? Anyway. Um, really lovely. Thank you, Claire, and anonymous, generous gifter. I appreciate that very much. This will be useful. I'm actually looking into getting a new workbench. This will go really, really well on that, and I appreciate it. Yeah. And Young Black Economist says, well, thanks for getting me through that 50-minute commute. Have you got some sort of unlimited data or something like that, Young Black Economist? That sounds awesome. Were you were you listening to me during your commute? Were you driving or, or on the train or taking the ferry or a camel or, or what? Horseback. I used to have to do that almost every day, too. It's really nice to not have to commute that far anymore. Definitely unlimited data. There you go. Nice. Well, Young Black Economist, it's good to have you back. Welcome to Paleontologizing, and welcome home. Take a load off. Let me know if you've got any questions about fossils. We are going through... We've got one more item. Again, thank you, Claire Burr and uh, generous anonymous gifter for sending me this clamp. I will treasure this and I will use it only for good, I promise. We've got another item, a big one right here. Our last one from the P.O. Box this week. Whoa! What is this? There... There appear to be two boxes inside of this. See how it shifts? I have an idea as to what this is. It almost seems it almost seems like it might be 3D printer filament, just based on the weight. This is about two kilos. 3D printer filament spools are usually about one kilo each. It seems like there's two boxes in here. They're about the right size for that. Are these 3D printer filaments? Filament spools? Well, let's take a look. Ooh. Oh, yes! Holy cow! And it's one of my favorite kinds of 3D printer filament. Hatchbox makes fantastic stuff. It is really, really good. And 
This should also tell me who it's from. What are the colors? We've got Matt Navy. Yes, for our coelacanth. We're going to be able to print a huge coelacanth with this. Holy cow. That is really exciting. Yeah. Check this out. That is an entire spool of 3D printer filament, and there are two of them. Very nice. Oh, man. We're going to be having a very special coelacanth stream on December 23rd of this year to mark the anniversary of the discovery of Latimeria Columnae. Yeah. And who do I have to thank for this? My goodness. Golganak. Holy cow. Yes, indeed. Golganak says, apologies that I can only do two right now. That's incredible, Golganak. You know I love the coelacanth. I love the coelacanth too, Golganak. Thank you for expressing this love through incredible generosity. I, uh... I cannot wait to print this. Well, I might have to wait, but holy cow, it's going to be big when we do it. I got to make sure it's done before December 23rd when we have our special coelacanth stream. Yeah. And let me show you the coelacanth model that I have here. I believe this is it. It's loading. It's loading. Yeah. It's taking a while to load. It's a big. It's, that's a big file. Um, plenty detailed. Here we go. Yeah. Sure is taking its sweet time here. One hour later. Yes, Morphosaurus. Yeah, there we go. This, holy cow, is our coelacanth model. And there's the print bed right there. So that's how big they suggest that we print it, but I think I'm going to be embiggening this significantly. We are going to have a sizable coelacanth, and that is going to be really, really neat. Yeah, holy cow. Is that going to be awesome? Check that out. Yeah. And for anybody who is wondering what in the world is a coelacanth, why is this guy so excited about a fish here? Oh, man. Do I have a cool story to tell you about? Let me find you a decent video here. Hmm. You know what? Let's just take a look at this again because I love this video so much and you're going to really like it too. The animation style in it is superb. And, um... Oh, it's good. Uh, Balint, Cyan Streams, you know about the coelacanth, right? Can we... 
Can we get a shout out for uh, for Science Streams here, real quick? If anybody's not yet following Belint at Science Streams, you are missing out. One of the greatest science communicators on the internet. Someone who does this probably more often than I do. Holy cow! Belint has got incredible devotion to uh, to science outreach online. It's kind of astonishing. Um, Go check out Science Streams. Blint is a, a systems and molecular biologist. He does all kinds of really awesome stuff on stream, from looking at ancient amber from the uh, the Cenozoic era, to uh, you know talking about ants, discussing the newest discoveries in molecular biology. All kinds of really really cool stuff. Go check out Science Streams right now. Again, if there is anybody who's following me who's not following Science Streams then that's baffling to me. If you're interested in science, go follow Science Streams immediately. Waste not an instant. Anyway, Belint, are you familiar with the story of the coelacanth? You probably are already. I yammer on about this all the time, but here from that... Dope. No, we want playback speed to be normal. There we go. You have this fish that's, it's like a sort of living time machine. Yeah. It was like looking at a dinosaur. This creature <laughs> Isn't this video great, Mimi Akoda? million years. And Science Stream says, I learned about them in my comparative vertebrate anatomy class. Yeah! CVA. CVA, a diff very difficult class. That's so cool that you had a CVA class. In. I didn't realize that. Um, CVA, I like helped teach CVA for a while. Um, but yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. And did you miss the P.O. box? You just missed it, Nell. Did you? Did you send me one of the items, Nell? Did you send me those magnets, Nell? If so, thank you very, very much. I was going on about how those are super useful, and I'm really excited about them. Um, yeah, yeah, let me know. Uh, but yeah, the coelacanth, a really, really important creature. We were talking about Tiktaalik earlier. My 3D printed Tiktaalik, I'll, I'll show you on Monday when I get it glued together. Um, but this is one of those creatures, the coelacanth, that is more closely related to you and me, to you and me. Thanks, present day Danny. That was weird. Some um, non-consensual hotkeys there. Um, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Well, pretend that this lungfish here is a coelacanth. Because, same difference. A lungfish or a coelacanth is more closely related to a cow than it is to a salmon. A lungfish or a coelacanth is closer, more closely related to us than it is to a salmon. Yeah. Um... What an incredible animal. They are super, super cool. And Nell, you sent me the clamp. I really appreciate that, Nell. Thank you very, very much, Nell. Really appreciate that. This will turn out to be quite useful. Especially as I look into getting a new workbench. This is going to be super, super helpful. So thank you very much, Nell. I really appreciate it. It's good stuff. Yeah. Um, anywho, yeah, let's get back to our video talking about coelacanths. It was December the 22nd, 1938. On this I thought it was December 23rd. Hang on. December the 22nd, 1938. 
Well, 22nd, 23rd tomato potato. Um, we'll figure it out. Maybe we'll have a stream on both days. But, uh, yeah. On this uh, hot December day. <laughs> hot December day. Of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's hot on Christmas Day. It's the middle of the summertime. Um... Yeah, and again, I can't, I don't know if I can find a clip. And this will be the best we can do right now, but there's a Simpsons moment here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um... Protect your fingers because you need those to prospect for fossils. It's true, Nell. It's true. Thank you, Nell. I appreciate your concern. Yeah. Um. Anyway, it was a hot December day. 1938. On this uh, hot December day in East London, South Africa, a trawler came into town and deposited its load of fish. And the trawler captain had a habit of keeping any odd looking interesting specimens and giving them to the curator of the local museum, Marjorie Courtney Latimer. She loved nature so much and she wanted to make the museum's collections the best they possibly could be. And so she went down to the, the harbour side. Uh, she described picking through this big pile. There are three pretty big boys in front of me. Right in front. Wait, right now? Young Black Account, you're walking your dog and seeing deer and. Watching paleontologizing at the first place. You must be a world-class multitasker. That's amazing. If I did that, I'd be running into deer and the dog would be running around my legs like a snow speeder, you know, trying to trip up an AT-AT -AT walker. Um, and then I'd probably accidentally put the wrong emotes into chat. I'm impressed, young black economist. N nicely done. Say hi to the deer for me. Anyway, back to our video. Isn't this animation style really cool? It's a neat, neat video, Ash Rubber. It's really cool. Uh, the harbor side. She described picking through this big pile of slimy fish and eels. And then suddenly she saw poking up this sort of strange blue fin. Blue fin. But it's a very distinctive kind of fish with strange, fleshy, limb-like fins. This thing was like nothing she had ever seen. Yep. She said to the chairman of the museum, I think this is something really special. He went, oh no, little Latimer, it's just a rock cod. But she knew in her gut that it was something different. Yep. She thought, well, I've got to find a way to preserve it. She recognized the importance of this. So Marjorie Courtney Latimer is a hero for this reason. She found this incredibly bizarre fish in a fish market. She recognized that it was something strange, like nothing she'd ever seen before. And she had enough faith in herself to say, hey, I, I know what I'm talking about here. This, this is weird. And I need to show someone. I need to preserve this thing. And she did. And there were all of these hurdles thrown in front of her. And she persevered. Christmas Eve in East London. She tried to get the local cold storage company to take care of it. They said, oh, no way. Go away. She tried to get a local mortuary to embalm it. They said, oh, we can't have any stinking fish here. <laughs> she said, why? All the other people in here are dead anyway. So eventually it was given to a taxidermist. Uh, and she thought, well, I've got to find someone to identify this fish. And she immediately... This is a rare opportunity to view the inside story of the extraordinary world of paleontologists. Vedator. What they do, why what they do is important for science and society. Vedator thank you, Sam Waterston. And, and thank you, Vedator CZ. Paleontologists. How are you doing? How is your stream? I hope it was really, really good. Welcome to the channel. It's good to have you here. Holy cow. Um, 
let me know if you've got any questions. We are just watching a little video about the good old coelacanth, the old four legs, as it's sometimes called. Because we have got a total of five spools of 3D printer filament with which to print a big old coelacanth. I am very, very excited about this. Because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Zenfail, thank you for con converting that Prime sub to a tier one sub. Zenfail. Zenfael. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank you kindly. For everybody just waltzing in, uh, including Verator. Thank you very much for the raid. We're watching a little video about the discovery of the coelacanth, this remarkable, remarkable fish. One of perhaps my favorite non tetrapod sarcopterygian. What a cool critter. Uh, my favorite living fish, we'll say. Non tetrapod fish. I originally thought of Professor J.L.B. Smith. who was the only ichthyologist in South Africa. So she drew a wow. one fish scientist in the whole country. And we sent a letter. As soon as he saw the fish, he walked round and round it slowly. He practically fainted. He said it was like bombs going off in my head and I was <laughs> seeing the shape of a fish. Yogurt Garrel. I rolled up some coelacanth playing Katamari last week, lol. Wait, you did? They've they have coelacanths in, in Katamari Calamari Donbury? Yogurt Garrel, is that right? Is that a thing? I gotta look this up right now. Katamari coelacanth. That's a, that looks like a coelacanth right there. Yeah. No joke. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Look at that lobe fin on it. And look at that diffy circled tail. That That is a coelacanth. Very nice. That's pretty cool, Yogurt Garrel. Thanks for sharing, and thank you for the 28 months of support. That's a long time, Yogurt Garrel, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. And that is a cool Easter egg. Yeah, Cyan Streams, definitely. Yeah. I have also played Katamari Damachi. Um, Ios and Lordi introduced me to that game. You know what? It's fun. I like, I like that game. It's pretty neat. There's actually another game in which you can uh, you can see a coelacanth. A game called Animal Crossing. I'm just kidding. Animal Crossing. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. There it is right there. Yeah, it's actually a really well done model of this animal. Like, I'm really impressed by it. No, well, that's not it. There we go. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Really, really blast from the past. A coelacanth. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Anyway. The coelacanth. Let's uh let's get back to this here. Letter. As soon as he saw the fish, he walked round and round it slowly. He practically fainted. <laughs> he said it was like bombs going off in my head and I Yeah. 
Oh man. The shape of a fish known only from fossils. It's such a characteristic shape. Kennedy, it would like be incredibly exciting, like Kennedy, yeah. Yeah. This was the coelacanth. Yep. A fish that was thought to have become extinct 65 million years ago. It was like a dinosaur had just come into your living room. Oh, Yogurt Garrel. Yogurt Garrel, I appreciate you. I never want to get rid of you. You're wonderful, Yogurt Garrel. Thank you for being here. Ah, thank you for your ongoing support. These were just a bunch of fishes, very much like other kinds of fish that were around at the time. But now they are these absolute anomalies. There's nothing else like it on the planet. They had, in fact, made the discovery of the century. It was given the name Latimeria Chalumne in honor of Marjorie Courtney Latimer. Without her, the specimen wouldn't yeah. have been preserved. The key excitement was the fact that this was such an obvious living fossil. Charles Darwin came up with the term. It's sort of dumb in a way, because if it's alive, it can't be a fossil. But what it means is there's <laughs> an early fossil record, it's true. a total gap, and then there happens to be a living one. It doesn't mean that hundreds and hundreds of its relatives haven't become extinct. Oh, and by the way, the reason that this is like hourglass shaped like this or shapely woman shaped or whatever you want to call it, pear shaped, whatever. Like coelacanth saw an extinction at the end of the Permian. And then they diversify a little bit again during the Mesozoic and then pfft, seemingly in the fossil record, they go extinct. They just, they disappear. But then we've still got at least two species alive today. But we've got zero fossil record for the entire Cenozoic era, the entire age of mammals. From the end of the age of dinosaurs until the present, no fossil record. So it's it's pretty strange. But they just became rare. Um, they, yeah, their numbers declined a lot right here. And they expanded a bit, and then they declined seemingly down to zero here. But you know what? We've still got two species swimming around today. One of the things that I love about the coelacanth is... Mr. Knight, the IT guy, says, can we understand the temperature for those eras? I mean, it's not so much temperature as it is, like, what's going on on Earth. So, like, an asteroid hit Earth right here, wiped out the dinosaurs, except for birds, wiped out about maybe 70 or 80% of other species on Earth including most of the coelacanths, but a few of them managed to squeak through. And today we have them. Yeah. Uh, here, this was the end Permian extinction. This is like 90% of life on Earth went extinct right, right here due to, well, extreme global warming. So I guess, Mr. Knight, the IT guy, this is does have to do with temperatures, certainly. There was some extreme global warming, ocean acidification going on right here at the end of the Permian period. And that uh, decreased the coelacanth's number significantly. Yeah. Yeah. Relatives haven't become extinct. One of the things that I love about the coelacanth is that it's seen history past. Yeah. When the coelacanths first appeared. So coelacanths first appear around the same time that Tiktaalik is around in the Devonian. As one lineage of lobe fin fishes, among other similar looking forms. Well, what can you say about the world? They shared the waters with strange, armored, jawless fish with sucker like mouths. Yep, astracoderms. Dunkleosteids, placoderms. One lineage of their close relatives started. Tiktaalik, right there. There we go. There's Tiktaalik, whom we were talking about earlier. Bingo. Yeah. What a cool critter. Um, Nosing yeah. around in the shallows, and then I suppose from the coelacanth's perspective, just sort of disappeared out of view as they emerged up onto the land. I like to see the coelacanth saying, "Bye and good luck." <laughs> we get into the the period of the coal swamps, producing so much oxygen that it becomes possible for dragonflies the size of falcons and millipedes longer than a man. That the high oxygen levels may not actually be entirely why these creatures got so big, these terrestrial arthropods, but it's probably part of it. The 
world is suddenly struck by a gigantic mass extinction, something like 90% of all species disappear. Coelacanths sort of keep going, they've perhaps taken a bit of a knock, but there are quite a lot of them, they swim around, do the coelacanth thing. Another huge mass extinction. <laughs> uh. Then mammals diversify on the land, primates emerge, one primate lineage starts standing up on its hind limbs, starts speaking, and here we are. And meanwhile, coelacanths, well, they haven't really changed. I mean... That's not actually true. They have changed quite a bit. But but they're unique. That is a, a, a truly astonishing thing. For me personally, it is just that the world should have such things in it. That it should be possible to see this kind of improbable ghostly messenger from the very deep past. And I just hope that the coelacanth manages to outlive us all and keep going and witnessing what is to come. Pretty cool stuff. So this is the creature that we will be printing with those five spools of 3D printer filament. Thank you again, Golgenek. You know I appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. Holy moly. And uh, if you'd like to see a, uh, a video of a live coelacanth, well, shoot. There you go. They're still around today, obviously. Oh my god, I see it! I see it! So, ignore the audio here. It's a little cheesy. They clearly dubbed it over in post. It's not actually what they were saying at the time. Whatever. Yeah. language there it is look at this incredible animal look at the size of it so see that that beautiful blue color yeah, that's the same color as this filament. Oh, man. Got the chatter red, too. There you go, Quavery. <laughs> yeah. What a beautiful animal. Holy cow. Just gorgeous. Just truly gorgeous yeah and that is a coelacanth yep Okami you betcha Ugh. a creature very closely related to the fish that came onto land and later gave rise to dinosaurs and and to us and to every other land living vertebrate animal pretty incredible yeah and so much maneuverability these guys can they can like moonwalk backward through the water using their uh, their muscular fins it's pretty incredible Claire Burr. they can turn upside down they can do a headstand and they do that a lot they do headstands for whatever reason. We're still kind of figuring that out. RCS thrusters. There you go, Claire. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Charlie's Dragon. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. So this is where they live in these underwater, like, volcano stacks. It's 
so cool. And you can see why they're called lobe-finned fish. So you've got this big fleshy lobe right here. It's like a leg. And that is essentially what it is. You have a limb on this fish with those fin rays coming off of it. All this part is muscle in here. Unlike just about any other fishes. The coelacanth's paired fins move as if it's walking through the water. Yep. Its distinct and powerful three-lobed tail is found on no other living creature. What up, baby? Earth. Give me five. Yeah, there you go. Ah, <laughs> oh, they're such incredible animals. They really are. Here, maybe I can find you a little bit more footage of diving with coelacanths here. Here we go. Got something down there. Check that out. That's um pretty incredible. Yeah. Look at that. And these captions are a little goofy. So it seems like they only exist in places where you've got, like, underwater volcanic uplift, and you've got lots of crags and caves and crevices. They love underwater caves. And there it is. Not, you know, it's it's almost going to do like a headstand here. Whoop. And there it goes. This is the same footage, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway. Um, very cool stuff. So I'm going to be printing one of these. It's going to be really, really lovely to have come on now. Have this, but so much bigger. <laughs> this, this, this model's like this big. We're going to print it big. And thanks to Golganek, I can print it very large. We've got five spools of filament to use. That's gonna be, uh... That is gonna be pretty awesome. What an incredible animal. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway. Awesome. Let's check on our 3D printer, by the way, and see how that's doing. Looks like we're almost done with this. That is lovely. Right now, I am printing the skull of a creature called Hypsilophodon. There we go. And this is what we sometimes today, it's a term that I learned this summer, we call a speedo. Small-bodied, early diverging ornithischian. We used to call them hypsilophodonts. Some people still call them that. But, uh, yeah, these are small, beaky, plant-eating dinosaurs. Can you see the outline of the skull? Right here. See that lower jaw and the upper jaw? How much longer do we have on this? Let me check. Four minutes. Four minutes left. Yeah. Excellent. So in four short minutes, we'll be able to pull this off the print bed and uh, 
could show it to you. Beautiful timing here. Yeah. You have to fit in your office too, not just the 3D prints. Yeah, Charlie's Dragon. I might be moving soon, actually, into a larger space. And so, it might be a little bit easier to fit the 3D prints and myself into the office. Yeah. So we'll see about that. Uh, anyway. I wonder if we can find any videos on Hypsilophodon. You know, it's tricky. It's not an animal that's appeared in media very much. Um, it's an important dinosaur in the history of dinosaur paleontology, but it's really not appeared in in media very much. Apparently, it's in the game The Isle. Um... Here it is here. This might give you some kind of mechan uh, idea of, of like what it's like. Slow it on blind mechanic. So it's a little beaky plant-eating dinosaur. We don't actually know if it had feathers like these, but they're showing it with feathers. Huh. That's interesting. I do not know what's going on here. It's blinding the other dinosaur? The Carnotaurus there? Strange. Anyway, Hypsilophodon. Hypsilophodon, little beaky plant-eating dinosaur. That's a pretty good depiction right there. They may or may not have been covered with feathers. We're not totally sure yet. Here's an old Dorling Kindersley model of it. Like you'll see in a lot of old books and stuff. Yeah. This is a really old reconstruction back when... Was it Louis Dolo thought that these animals were tree dwellers? Yeah. Anyway, it's a little beaky, plant-eating, fast-running dinosaur, Hypsilophodon. It's a neat critter. And there's a little book right there, Hypsilophodon. Um, one of the more important dinosaurs from the UK, I would say, to the history of dinosaur paleontology. Yeah. And even in the novel Jurassic Park, the hipsies are said to hang out in the trees. I thought those were a different taxon. Weren't they like Nanosaurus or Drinker or... Shoot, what were they in the novel Jurassic Park? That's where that idea comes from, them hanging out in trees. But, um... What were they? Were they Othnelia? I think they were Othnelia, right? I don't know, it's been so long since I've read this. I gotta read it again sometime soon, I guess. But um, I'm pretty sure they were Othnelia in the book. Um. List of dinosaurs in Jurassic Park novel. Um, Carnotaurus was not in the Jurassic Park, the novel. What? Um, dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Tyrannosaurs, Myosaurs, Stegosaurs. They're not really... Othnelia, there we go. And Hypsilophodontids. Interesting. Um Anyway. Yeah. 
But Hypsilophodonts, like you see here, this is a group of dinosaurs that is probably not all closely related to each other. Um, yeah. I guess maybe in Jurassic Park, the novel, they have Hypsilophodonts and Othnelia. It's interesting that Othnelia is considered separate. And it's funny that it redirects to Nanosaurus. It's called Othnelia in the book, but this little dinosaur, we now call it Nanosaurus. It turns out it's probably not separate. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, Claire, you weren't wrong. Definitely not. But these critters, Hypsilophodonts. If you hear the word Hypsilophodont, know that it's not necessarily like a, a real dinosaur group, but it, it kind of pertains to a certain body shape, where it's like if you're a plant eater who run, who's small, who runs on two legs, you got a beak, you might get called a Hypsilophodont. It turns out these critters are probably not all super closely related to each other. But, um, yeah. Anyway, Hypsilophodonts. They basically look like this. They're the little guys next to this Tenontosaurus. Running and springing about. Doing their thing. Hypsilophodonts. And that is the critter who has just finished printing here on the printer. Let's pull this off. Yeah. There we go. We've got both sides of our Hypsilophodon skull right here. Let me show you on the desk. Yeah. Uh, this is going to require some cleaning and some trimming, and it's smaller than I thought it would be, too. Yeah. But, um... Oh, boy. take off some of the supports right now, if not all of them. And it's going to fit together like that. We'll get those supports removed. And it's, man, this is small, very small. I printed it the same size that was suggested in the file, but it almost it almost seems too small. But yeah, little plant-eaten dinosaur here. There's a classic Hypsilophodon done by John Sibick right there. But it's funny, I don't know if Hypsilophodon actually appears in, like, any movies or anything animated. It's not in Walking with Dinosaurs, it's not in Jurassic Park, it's not in Disney's Dinosaur, it's not really anywhere. Despite being an important dinosaur in the history of dinosaur paleontology, it's, uh... Yeah. It hasn't really gotten a lot of attention recently, which is interesting. And it is a good shape, nice and fast, young buck economist. Exactly, yeah. So these dinosaurs are often compared to, like, gazelles. You know? Um. So, yeah. Yeah. Running was probably their chief defense. 
There's a, a similar animal that did appear in Walking with Dinosaurs. In fact, there was a whole episode about it. Called... Lealinosaura. Take a look. So this dinosaur you're going to see right here. There we go. This is a lot like Hypsilophodon. A lot like this little dinosaur here. Oh, there's beautiful tree ferns there, too. Yeah. This is an Australian dinosaur for any of the Australians in chat. Yeah. Was that a, a Dougal Dixon book? There you go, Claire. Nice. <laughs> Listen to those clicks. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Um anyway. Good old Hypsilophodon. There is a very similar dinosaur who has just been named. from the Isle of Wight in the UK. This is from five hours ago. New plant-eating dinosaur unveiled, Vectodromius insularis. There we go. We'll be talking about this more, I think, on Monday. Because I'm still waiting on the paper. I don't actually have access to this journal, and I emailed the author, lead author on this. Uh, he hasn't sent it to me yet, but that's Nick Longrich, and uh, he was actually out in the field with me this summer. So we spent a good amount of time together. I'm hoping he'll send me that paper so we can do a proper deep dive on this brand new dinosaur. But it is very similar to, in fact, might be the ancestor of Hypsilophodon. So, yeah. Yeah. So, tune in on Monday for that. We'll be talking about it. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And, uh... With that having been said... Oh, by the way, let's check on our 3D printer. We're printing a heterodontosaurus skull right now. In two parts, just like our Hypsilophodon skull. This will be done in probably about four or five hours. So I'll be able to show that off on Monday as well. Remember, we've got so many dinosaur skulls. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, it is, I'm going to set aside like a whole day pretty much before stream to uh, smoothing all of these with that XTC 3D stuff, which I'm kind of running out of. I've got some on the, the wish list if anybody would... If anybody's feeling super generous about that. If anybody's feeling super generous and they, uh... They would like to, to buy some of that. Yeah... Um, here. Check this out. This is how it works. It's really cool stuff. For 3D printed parts. It works yeah. especially on PLA and PET, for example. So you start off with component A, which uh, is a 2 to 1 ratio. So you have two parts of the A. Then we add one part of B. Really simple then 2 to 1 ratio. Together. 
Um, we're using the included brush here. Um, this makes it into a nice, nice combo. And then you take a printer part, in this case a PET from Talman, and you start coating. Just so paint that over the surface. Both the inside and the outside. Near yeah. I think 0.8 millimeter layer. And uh, it gives it this beautiful kind of. And again, we're taking just the glossy feel. One it of the parts you can really it see. actually like partly melts the yes, the filament, as I understand it, just a little bit in order to get so rid of those 3D really print lines. Um, you can really see it on this model here. Yeah. So you can actually see much more transparent. And this is a really clear image. Now, now I have the model slightly angled so you don't see uh, the layers like in this one. Here you can see this is behind. And I do actually have some clear filament that I'll need in order to make some stands for some of these skulls and stuff like that. And I'll be applying some of this, I hope, to that clear filament in order to actually make it more transparent like that. It's really cool. It's actually two, two hey, Brit. Yeah. And this is the uh, solid opaque model coated. So you can see the down, uh, the lower part is, is really smooth. It's almost like it's um, clear coated or something like that. It's a bad. Yeah, anyway, this is really, really lovely to make these things look more like actual fossils, you What's know? What's up, you guys? Welcome yeah. Uh, Anywho. All right, so uh, it's been about 10 minutes since I finished the whole element. Am I seeing any effects? Is it like a Power Rangers mask? I am what is initially that? seeing definitely some difference. Definitely it looks, uh, I don't know, wet and glossy. Kind of how that picture right there makes it look like. Is it the effect I'm aiming for and looking for? Iron so, Man. Again, there you go. This cool. Took me 10 minutes of no sanding at all. And I've only done one coat. And it's only the top part. The inside of it needs to be done too. So I'm gonna work on that next. Neat. But before we get yeah. to that, let it cure a little bit so I can, you know, touch and all that. Valint's favorite Avenger is not the Ant Man, Kennedy. How could that be the case? Shouldn't the Ant Man be Valint's favorite Avenger? Or maybe that's. Maybe he's allied with Batman on the other side of the cladogram of superheroes. I don't actually... My superhero phylogeny... Phylogenetic knowledge is is pretty much nil. I'm not sure which clade the Ant-Man belongs to. Is he allied with with Batman and, and Spider-Man? Or is he allied with Superman and and Iron Man? I don't, I don't know these things. I don't know these things. You know, I maybe there are, are more molecular studies out there that have been published recently. I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, Batman is D.C. Oh, so he's from the East Coast, the District of Columbia. And Ant-Man is Marvel. Nice. OK. Very cool. Well, where is why? Where is is Spider-Man? Where where? Where does he come out on the tree? You know? Um, yeah. And do we have any appropriate music? Apparently not. Here. Let's go back up to... Um, there we go. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Spider-Man lives about five miles from me. Very cool, Kennedy. Well, tell him I say hi the next time you run into him at the library or... Or the rummage sale. Yeah. And you got that field guide. Very cool, Hugan. You're talking about the Greg Paul dinosaur field guide? Nice. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Good stuff. So Spider-Man lives in New York. But but Batman does not live in New York City. He lives in another city called Gotham, right? Which is fictional. So do, do Batman and, and Spider-Man never never meet and 
if you never see Spider-Man and Batman in the same place, if they've never been photographed together, how are you sure they're not the same person? Hmm. He lives in D.C. Oh, thank you, Rizu Dago. He lives in the District of Columbia. Maybe under the Capitol building. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah. Hmm. Uh, anyway, this stuff is on the wish list. Um, I'm gonna need a ton of this for all of these 3D prints, like our Allosaurus skull over here. Holy cow. I'm gonna require... A lot of that for this, because this is a hefty, hefty print. I, um, yeah. And if you look up close, there's a lot of, can I maneuver this under the camera here? Let's look at those teeth up close, for instance. Now look right here. Right here. You see those lines right there? If I want this to be a museum quality specimen, we gotta get rid of those lines. We gotta smooth this thing up, you know? Ugh. And so you could do that a little bit through sanding, but really you need something to smooth the actual print itself if you want to really do that well. And, uh... I've used this XTC stuff before many, many times. I even have a little bit of it on here. You can actually see where it's extra shiny. Right here. Yeah. I wanted to shore up the, uh, the joint between the upper and lower jaws. Right here. And so I'd put in some water putty. which is excellent stuff. I love water putty. Holy cow, that's what we would use on fossils at Museum of the Rockies to fill in cracks and stuff. And then I hit that with some XTC 3D print smoother over the top of it, and um, it, went, uh, it went really well. But I'm running out of it. I need to get some more. So anyway, yeah. I'm just gonna drop this here from blue. Nina, what is this? Oh, so Batman and Spider-Man have met and they have a child together? What? Am I misreading this? Wow. Crazy stuff. Bizarre. I don't know how that works, but you know... Yeah. Uh, but normally they're in two different universes. Wouldn't that be different multiverses then? Doesn't universe the term itself imply that there's just one of them? You know? I don't know. Anyway. Um... Let's put this away for now. Oh, boy. Ah! There we are. Yeah. Um. <laughs> anyway. Ah. <laughs> uh... What was I going to talk about here? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Gimpleg, are you here right now in chat, Gimpleg? One of our loyal viewers. Because Gimpleg shared a really cool thing with me on Twitter earlier. And uh, I'd like to show that off. Here it is. Yeah. And... It's 
squiggles? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> and reason I guess is that a weight complaint or a large awkward item complaint? L large awkward item, not a complaint, just a an expression of this thing is large and awkward. Yeah. Don't mean to complain. Yeah. It does not appear that Gimpleg is here right now. Or else I would show off this video, but maybe we'll do that on Monday. Um, yeah. They may be sleeping? All good, Claire Burr. All good. And, uh... A xenomorph... A strange form skull on Danny's wall? Xenomorph, that name that means strange form, Kennedy. I don't I've got many different critters that could be considered strange forms, I suppose. I do not have a Xenoceratops. Although I suppose I could. There are casts of this animal's skull to be found there. Xenoceratops. The strange horned face. Um, the Ripley franchise. That's also the name they give to the aliens in the Alien franchise. Why do they just call them aliens? The film's called Alien, and then the sequel is called Aliens. And then you have Alien Resurrection, and Alien Revolutions, and Alien Redemption. And, uh, Alien... I don't, I don't actually know the sequels. Um... They don't just call them aliens? I've seen I've seen the first two films. I don't remember that name, that term xenomorph from that. Are you sure that's not like just a fan thing? Alien, total eclipse, yeah. Alien apocalypto. Yeah. Um Alien Recycling. Alien in the Goblet of Fire. There you go, Thalo. Yes, indeed. Alien. And the Goblet of Fire. Yeah. Hmm. Alien 22 Xeno Boogaloo. <laughs> if it were Xenu Boogaloo, then it could be a Scientology thing. There you go, Thalo. Yeah. Um. Yeah. One of the guys calls them xenomorphs, but as a generic term for any alien life form, which makes sense. Gamers Tavern Show, that makes sense because that's what that term means. Xenomorph just means strange form. And it does sound generic, you know? It for that to be the name of those creatures doesn't it like kind of I don't know. It rankles me for some reason. It rubs me the wrong way. You know? Just call them the aliens from the movie Alien. Or aliens. You know? My big fat alien's wedding. There you go, Squiggles. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, where's my spaceship? An alien story. Um. Yeah. Aliens First Blood Part 2. <laughs> Colonina, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway. Hey, Alien, the Legend of Curly's Gold. <laughs> Alien works. That's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of back when I was in Spanish class in high school and we were learning about the, that verb tense, the preterite. And then we had to do some sort of like drawing for something for some reason. And I I drew one of the aliens from the movie Alien wearing like a sombrero with some maracas. And the caption was alien versus preterite. And uh, 
I wish I'd kept that. If, I might still have it. It might be somewhere in my dad's garage or something. But yeah. Anyway, it was it was good stuff. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Um. Since we're just kind of goofing around right here. I believe there was a documentary that I spotted the other day, an old one. There we go. On Tom Holtz's Twitter profile. Tom Holtz, if you're not following him, you're missing out on all kinds of cool fossil news and stuff. If there's like one person to follow on Twitter about fossil news with particular attention paid toward dinosaur news. Follow Tom Holtz. But he says the great granddad or the granddaddy of dinosaur documentaries, Horizon slash Nova, hot blooded dinosaurs. Behold how young everyone is. This is gonna be neat. Here. Hold on to your butts. Let's take a look. Hmm. Oh boy. Let's hope there's closed captions. No closed captions? I'm sorry. Shoot. Well, you can't win them all. But let's... Uh, let's get into it a little bit. This old truck on an arid desert road. That looks like a Chevy. These are the prairies of Alberta in western Canada. Is this going to be Phil Curry? Years ago. Dinosaurs lived here. Ah. Thank you, reanimated, reanimated bit. Welcome back. The valley of the Red Deer River, where wind and water have eroded the soil to form badlands. Yeah, badlands, best lands, more like it. This is the sort of territory you find excellent fossils in. I've never seen this before. This is really cool. It's to these badlands that dinosaur hunters come looking for fossils as they weather out of the ground. Yep. And Claire Burr says, I wonder what the ratio of folks who think Mr. Arnold meant your buttocks and those who think cigarette but He meant cigarette butt. I always assumed he meant, you know, your tush. Claire Burr, I've never thought about it that way before. What? Although I'm not a smoker. Um. Huh. Huh. Interesting thought, Claire Burr. Dinosaurs were the largest and most successful creatures that ever lived. They huh. dominated the Earth for 120 million years. Trying to explain their success has always caused fierce debates. In this program, we present the views of one group of paleontologists who think they've found the reasons for it. Ooh. Today, dinosaurs are being given a surprising new image. This is back in what, the early 1980s? Christy Zartnook, thank you for being here. What howdy, how did you too? Welcome. Like? How did they live? In Hollywood, at least, they thought they had the answers. Mm. Agathomus. This is from 1925. This is an old one here. Holy cow. Yeah. This was a silent film originally. It didn't have sound like this. For science, Passing pterosaur. Oh, get wrecked, pterosaur. Names has always been difficult. Stegosaurus, a plant eater. <laughs> Gigantic brontosaurs, the largest dinosaurs of all. Oh, boy. You remember watching this as a kid, Fairy Willow? Wow, I've never seen this before. This is the first I've ever seen it. That's pretty cool. Iguanodon, one of the first discovered. 1977? That makes sense, Kennedy. Tyrannosaurus yeah. rex. All these creatures have been argued over ever since they were first discovered. At the center of one long-running debate have been sauropods, like the brontosaurs. Mm. At Harvard University... 
Hang on a minute. Harvard University, long hair. Is this going to be Bob Bakker right here? That looks like it could be a Bakker illustration. Let's see. Is one of the new dinosaur revolutionaries, Bob Bakker. He's been interested in the way ideas. Uh, Bob Bakker pronounces his name Bakker, but apparently he's actually related to Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. He's like their he he's Jim Jim Baker's cousin or something like that. Um. Anyway, Bakker Baker tomato potato. But uh, he does look young, Claire Burr, yeah. These creatures have evolved. Might this be white, yeah. This is a sauropod dinosaur. Yeah, gamers, yeah. I generally draw sauropods or any other type of dinosaurs. First, a quick sketch of the outlines of the bones. And on that, I add the uh, major muscles. Model of them as the fossil bones indicate. And you can make uh, quite an accurate model of a dinosaur or any other fossil animal because the size and shape of the muscles is indicated by the marks on the bones. And yet, Bakker is an excellent author. Squills, I mean, shoot. His book, The Dinosaur Heresies, is... It remains a classic. This was my very favorite book about dinosaurs when I was probably 10 years old. The Dinosaur Heresies by Bob Bakker. Um... A huge, well, part of it, I think it's kind of easy to explain in hindsight. Part of it is his wonderful illustrations. Um, just really, really excellent. There, let me see if I can find some dinosaurs in action here. Yeah, there we go. There's a bunch of... Ornithischian dinosaurs all eaten there. He's a, he's a brilliant artist. Like, really excellent. Yeah. There's Nanosaurus pursuing a lizard, presumably to try and eat that lizard. Yeah. Which these animals, maybe they eat small vertebrates too. We're not totally sure. But anyway. Um, yeah. Part of it is his... Uh, You know, his excellent artistic style. Um, and part of it is just his enthusiasm. I mean, his his love for dinosaurs is palpable in this book. And for a kid who is obsessed with dinosaurs, this is, this is as good as it gets, you know? So, yeah. Big influence on me when I was a kid. Um, nowadays, I realize a lot of these ideas, you know, John Ostrom was actually espousing back in the 60s and stuff, so a lot of the stuff isn't truly original. Not like that harms it in any way, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, and there's, there's some, like, kind of wild outdated things in this book, like the idea that dinosaurs, their eventual extinction, except for birds, at the end of the Cretaceous was due to disease? Rather than to something like an asteroid impact? Um, there's... You would be very hard-pressed to find any paleontologist today, except for maybe Bakker, who still holds to that idea. The evidence does not support it. Really, in any way. But yeah, nothing's perfect. It's if you know a young person and and you would like to get them interested in dinosaurs, or if you would like to rekindle your love of dinosaurs yourself, this is not a bad book to start with. Holy cow! 1986's The Dinosaur Heresies. Regardless of your feelings on Bakker himself, it's um, it's a very engaging book, thought provoking, interesting stuff. I w I would recommend it. Yeah. Uh, the disease known as the giant asteroid impact. Very severe. Yeah, there you go, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah. Yeah. And Slayer Dark says, didn't most dinosaurs have three fingers? Um, it, mm, I wouldn't say most. Dinosaurs had 
there are some dinosaurs that had five fingers on each hand. That's the one. That's how many they started off with was five. It seems. Some dinosaurs brought that all the way down to one finger on each hand, like uh, Triracuncus here. Yeah, this is one of my dinosaurs. One finger on each hand. So it depends. Three is like a nice middle number, but I don't know if most dinosaurs had three fingers on their hands. Um, yeah, Tyrannosaurus famously had two. Tyrannosaurids, at least. Mononychines, like Truarconcus, famously have got one. So yeah, yeah. That's one of my favorite dinosaur facts debunked. There you go, Slayer Darth. That's why you come here to paleontologizing, you know? Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, my other dinosaur fact, which hopefully you can't debunk, is that pterodactyl is Latin for winged fingers. Oh boy, Slayer Darth. Not here to burst your bubble. Pterodactyl is Latin or maybe Greek for wing finger, yes. But pterodactyls, pterosaurs, not dinosaurs. They're not dinosaurs. They're, um... They're a different group of reptiles. Very closely related to dinosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs themselves. Yeah. Um, here, let me show you. So, what is and is not a dinosaur? What is a dinosaur and what isn't? There we go. So dinosaurs start here. Everything that evolves from this ancestor, everything on the tree up from this point is a dinosaur. Pterosaurs. Your flying reptiles like this pteranodon. Pterodactyls. Not dinosaurs. Yeah... Slayer Darth says, you've just ruined my childhood? No, I haven't. Don't be melodramatic. Pterosaurs are still incredibly cool animals. They're just not dinosaurs. Here we go. Here, take a look at this. Here... It's a Quetzalcoatlus challenging a Tyrannosaurus. There's T-Rex right there. Tyrannosaurus Rex. North America's top predator. With his six inch long teeth, Tearing through an Anamosaurus' uh, tough skin is not a problem. <laughs> Get lost, little Troodontid. Deinonychosaur. I don't know if that's a troodontid or a dromaeosaur. But here. Might be able to bully troodontids. Oh, well, it is a troodontid. As big as this. Yeah. Soon attracts more formidable competition. Here are your pterosaurs. Quetzalcoatlus, a giant pterosaur. Yeah. Not a dinosaur, but a pterosaur. One of the few creatures that will challenge an adult Tyrannosaur. Especially if there's two of them. Two, two Quetzalcoatlus, not two Tyrannosaurs. One strike from its six foot long beak could easily cost T Rex. Hang on, what's going on with the closed captions here? What was this? Who put that in there?
<laughs> you know, you know, hearing impaired people rely on these closed captions. They they should be as authentic as possible. Uh Is that right, Clairber? Okay. Huh. One strike to make six foot long beak could easily cost T Rex an eye. Even so, it seems that he's not going to back down. Oh. But the arrival of a second Quetzalcoatlus mm. changes the odds. All right, all right. Goodness. I guess we can't watch this because somebody decided to mess with the closed captions. But anyway. Check out Prehistoric Planet 2 if you'd like to figure out how this goes down. You know? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, pterosaurs, not actually dinosaurs. They're, uh, they're close relatives of the dinosaurs. Very close relatives, but not dinosaurs themselves. And hello, hello. Travis Tavern Society and their 15 raiders are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. Travis Tavern Society, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you for the raid. How did your stream go? It's great to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Here on Twitch doing some good old-fashioned science outreach and... um. Appreciate you bringing your viewers here. Let me know if you've got any questions, huh? Yeah. Element Eds, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's a pub crawl with a mustachioed novelist and voice actor Travis from the Tavern Society. A crowd of cool cats. And the next round is on us. Cheers, Element Eds. Appreciate that. Um, thank you, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, pterosaurs are a whole group name, Calamity Now. Yes, that is true. Um... You know, now might be a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, to call forth a friend of ours to introduce these new folks to the channel. Tell them what paleontologizing is all about. Shall we call forth previously recorded Danny? I think that's a good idea. Um, Again, Travis Tavern. Thank you so much. The stream went well. Did some editing on the last book. Wrote a couple thousand words on the next book. Excellent. How close are you to finishing it? I'm sure you get that question all the time. Sorry. But I'm excited for you. That's really cool, Travis. Thank you. Thank you for the raid. We're going to call forth a friend of ours to introduce you to the channel, tell you what this what this whole thing is all about. So without further ado, um, previously recorded, Danny, why don't you uh, show these new folks what we're all about here. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to Paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm gonna level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, Kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, 
a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspices of Jack Warner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, and fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchuncus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives, to help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So, we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. <laughs> oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover for to strike the whole world amazing. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it, by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. Genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. And I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, I'd be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. 
Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Travis Tavern Society for that raid there. Welcome back. It's good to have you. Thanks for bringing your viewers. Saggy Iguana says, I recommend paleontologizing to a lot of people I meet. I appreciate that, Saggy Iguana. Thank you. And GQ says, I agree. What is the point of science if we don't share it? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Badman Dex says, I got one question I've been wondering about. Glass jar necklace? I've got a command for that. Check it out in the chat there. Yeah. Yeah. Okami Kuma says, told the boys at work about you today. Well, thank you, Okami. I appreciate that. If they show up, I will be very happy to see them. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, Draminga Fight says, I was wondering what kind of tools do you use for excavating complicated fossils? Besides the usual hammer and chisel. Well, shoot. You can see some of this stuff happen firsthand on the YouTube page. Yeah, if we scroll down to some of our fieldwork live streams. Yeah. Maybe here? Yeah, here are some of the tools that we use in the field. Rock hammers, whisk brooms, paint brushes. Yeah, uh, feed scoops like this one right here. Yeah, and uh, I actually have some of these tools right here. I can show you. I well, they might be put away actually in storage right now. But anyway, things like the the major two, the two major tools that I use for the actual digging part are. Are these a scratch all like that? Um, this is the particular kind there. Yeah, Stanley. That's a good brand. Uh, use these for digging and also an oyster knife like this. These are the, the primary two tools that I actually use for physically digging. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's all good to hammer into the stone or just to pick at it? Both. Yeah, both. If you can get an awl that has a metal... Like, I don't know if it's called a pawling or what. But uh, a metal... It's got metal on the top, the part that you actually hammer onto. That's ideal. Because if you just have a wooden one... Serious game of paleontology. Conquest Publishing, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah, if you get one that's just wood, that wood will crack when you're hammering it after too long. You want one that... um. Yeah. Um... Is it called Pauling? What's it called? Maybe. See, this one just has wood on the end. You don't want that if you can help it. You want one that actually has a metal top to it. And unfortunately, those are really hard to find nowadays. I've not been able to find them anywhere online. I don't know if anybody makes them anymore like that. If we have any, any carpenters or people who know a thing or two about tools, if you know what that's called, I would love to hear that so that I can find these more easily in the future. But yeah, it's a metal part over the top for when you strike it with the hammer, it's got a metal little shielding thing on it. Yeah. Medium rock hammer. Oh, very nice. Uh, Jerminga fight. Very nice. That's a good starter set of tools. Yeah. Pipcat says, I think in Jurassic Park they were soaking fossils in vinegar. I do not remember that, Pipcat. Yeah. 
Um, vinegar, you can use it on certain fossils to, like, dissolve away some of the sediment, but it... Vinegar is acetic acid. And it... You gotta be careful with it. Because, A, it stinks. Like, it, it smells. Make everything smell like Easter eggs. Uh... And, uh, and B, like, it can actually dissolve away the fossils themselves, too. So, yeah, you gotta be careful with acetic acid. Um. Rizudego says, that tool is an awl. I know what, I know what an awl is, Rizudego. But. I have it right here. That, that's an awl, yes. But. What I want to know is there's a, a specific kind of awl that's got a metal shield over the handle part of it. So you can hit it with a hammer and the wood won't crack. It's like metal that goes all the way down the, like, through to the, you know, the metal tip. And I don't know what that's called. Metal pawling or metal... Oh, strike! Oh! Thank you, Risu Dagu. Let's, let's, let's try that. Metal strike. There we go. Yes. Oh, I appreciate you, Rizu Dego. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Shoot, can I find these on Amazon, perhaps? Um. Let's protect our fossils because so far nothing. If they're removed, America loses them forever. And Muffzilla, thank you for continuing that gift sub that you got there. From Zenfile, thank you so much, Muffzilla. I really appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. Enjoy being able to use those emotes as often as you would like. Without having to worry about your Prime sub running out. Thank you, thank you. Very, very much, Mufsilla. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your, your ongoing support. It means a lot to me. It really does. Welcome to the community. Um, yeah, it's... This is tricky. I'm trying to find... Do they just not make scratch awls anymore that have a metal strike on them? Hmm. Anyway, that is is basically what I need right there with that metal strike. Yeah. Thank you for the the terminology there, Rizudegu. I will use this only for good. And um. Well, there you go. Yeah, that's good stuff there, Claire Burr. Excellent. Demolition scratch all. Thank you, GQ. Let me let me search for that too. Um Ooh, those have also got that metal strike there. Nice. Yes. Thank you. I will be adding some more things to the wish list. I think. Like this right here. Klein tools. This is good stuff. This I would be honored to use in the field. Yeah, there we are. Check that out. Very nice. This would last me probably the rest of my career. If I'm gentle with it. Yeah. Irwin does make good stuff. Yeah. Klein, too. Let's hope. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Some tools of the trade. Yes, indeed. These are the kinds of tools that we use in the field. And uh, if you'd like to see those tools in use... Well... Here, I'm 
just kind of walking around here, I guess. Let's get back to the actual digging, shall we? There we go. Yeah. But, you know, you can see the extremely expensive, complicated tools that we use, like paintbrushes. Balls, plastic feed scoops, etc. Yeah. Here. Let's get some audio here. That's in your way. Don't worry. The bones will There's Fisher right there. <laughs> Ethan behind me. Plenty to do over here. Yeah. Got a couple new bones. Ooh, let's check them out. They're not particularly impressive, but. I gotta this watch where I put my hands. This one here looks like a rib. Yeah, that's very, very big. The, the tip there is missing. That's because it's stuck in the rock. Oh. So, okay. right, we, we remove little chunks of rock at mm -hmm. one piece at a time. And hopefully, the rock separates from the bone pretty evenly. And this time it did pretty well, except for just this one little corner. So, we'll have to glue this corner back on. But other than that, the whole rib thing looks like it's there. Nice. Very nice. Kind of a weird rib. Maybe a <laughs> cervical rib or something. I mean, you'd agree it's a rib, right? That totally looks like a rib head. I don't know what else it would be. But it's be. it's a unless it's a skull bone. But, but if you look at how different it is, how that. different it is from uh, yeah, Justin's rib over there, right? Huh? Like from a different part of the body, maybe. It's yeah. Different. Maybe it's a cranial bone that looks like a rib. Anyway, good stuff. This was a ton of fun being able to stream from the field this past summer, and uh, I guess I could talk about this really briefly. But um, I've been in contact with another member of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, which is our um, our professional organization for vertebrate paleontologists around the world. Um, yeah. Anyway, the, uh, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, our professional organization for vertebrate paleontologists around the world, um, it looks like I might be giving a talk toward the end of the month about live streaming, doing paleontological outreach on Twitch with a, an emphasis maybe on uh, on fieldwork live streams. I've got to get together a talk for that. Uh, and it's going to be pretty cool. So yeah, we do need more paleo streamers. I agree, Lenina. Yes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll keep you up to date on that, everybody. And maybe you'll even have a chance to watch it live. We'll see. It might be restricted to SVP members at first, but it looks like that's going to be a thing that uh, that will be available on YouTube later. So I'll let you know when that goes live. But yeah, I'm going to have a really busy couple weeks here. Holy cow. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um... Anyway, and it'll be cool, Ladina. It'll be really cool to help. Well, to, to kind of put the word out to more of my colleagues that, like, this is a way that you can do science outreach. This is a way that, that you can reach a larger audience is through live streaming like this. And you know what? You can do it from the field. You can broadcast live... Even while out in the field here. Kind of near the town of Moab. And uh, we've got a quarry over there where we're digging up the bones of what's probably a new Iguanodontian dinosaur. Probably. We'll see. Time will tell. And uh, we've got a bunch of kind of mystery bones that have started to emerge today. So I'll show you some of those and you'll get to watch us work. Ask whatever questions you want. 
all that good stuff. That's what uh, paleontologizing is all about, you know? Yeah. But yeah, that's one of the things I got to do this weekend to start start brainstorming ideas for this talk. How do I create an engaging little presentation and get across the idea that live streaming is it is one of the best ways to do science outreach. How do I get these ideas across in a presentation for my colleagues? I'm excited about it. It's going to be a challenge, but I'm excited about it. So yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, with all that having been said, it is about time for me to wrap this up. I've got some stuff I got to take care of tonight. I'm gonna work on this Hypsilophodon skull. Uh, on the Heterodontosaurus skull when that finishes printing. And then uh, I have some other stuff I need to attend to, including starting that presentation. I want to start early on this because I want to have it nice and polished by the time it's time to present it. Should be around the 27th or so. So with that, having been said, don't go away just yet, chat. We... going to wrap things up here. Don't flee just yet. Let's see who else is here on Twitch. Who maybe can we pay a raid to? Maybe somebody else doing some science here on Twitch? Oh, holy cow. Melissa in Denial is, uh, is doing a lecture right now. Not a paleontologist, but an archaeologist. There we go. Beyond the Nile lecture, Egyptologists who started their career as artists. That is going to be super cool. You're in for a treat, everybody. Thank you to everybody whose names are showing up here in the credits. Subscribers and resubscribers, moderators, raiders, followers, chatters, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for keeping me here on the air. And uh, thank you for your enthusiasm and your support. Appreciate you more than you know. And I'll see you for an exciting stream. We're talking about a brand new dinosaur, a new Hypsilophodont. Hypsilophodont. On Monday, we'll be talking about this. So stay tuned for that. Until then, everybody, you take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful weekend. Let's go see what Melissa's up to. All right.